team. Yeah. Hello. Yeah. Okay. I can see. I can see. Yeah. I can see him now. Okay. So, friends, uh, it's a great pleasure uh, to welcome you all to uh, this talk by uh, Professor Asanga Abhay Gunnashekara. Uh, he is uh, one of our uh, one of our uh, oldest. Uh, in fact, for a long time, I have known him, and uh, he has been uh, very generous uh, with his uh, uh, time with us in our earlier uh, uh, interactions, uh, particularly when I was in IDSA. And uh, today he's uh, going to talk to us uh, about uh, uh, China and uh, Sri Lanka. What is the relationship? How is the relationship developing? As you know, this is a very important uh, relationship in India. Uh, we follow uh, Sri Lanka's foreign policies very closely, but also uh, how the uh, Sri Lanka's relationship with China is uh, developing. Uh, it won't be exaggeration uh, to uh, say that uh, uh, there is uh, uh, a bit of a concern in India as to uh, the growing uh, the the scope uh, about the scope of uh, that uh, relationship. So people would have uh, people are quite concerned that uh, China, with its uh, Belt and Road Initiative, uh, is now. Uh, there in practically all our neighbor in, in our neighborhood and uh, in all the countries. I think uh, Sri Lanka uh, in the earlier dispensations as well as uh, now, uh, the relationship has deepened. But uh, there is uh, uh, a certain lack of uh, understanding uh, as to what this relationship exactly means. Quite often uh, we do not have uh, uh, knowledge about, uh, the data is also not uh, forthcoming. And of course, uh, there is uh, the politics of uh, this relationship. So uh, to talk about these uh, uh, issues, uh, we have uh, uh, Professor Asanga Abhay-Gurashekara with us today. And I welcome him uh, to the BIF and now hand over the floor to him. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, I, let me thank uh, Dr. Arvind. It's, it's a pleasure to, uh, to um, be, uh, with the VF and, um, and to speak, um, as you said uh, um, earlier, that, um, you know, um, how we, it was uh, during uh, the time of um, when I was a director at Lakshman Kadirigama Institute and uh, uh, 10 years ago that we signed an MOU, one of the first um, uh, with the IDSA, uh, which actually helped many of our researchers to understand um, uh, our thinking, regional thinking, as well as uh, uh, it's really important uh, areas that to work on. Um, so uh, I let me uh, share. I have prepared a, a PowerPoint. Uh, so let me share that. Um, can you all see this? Um, no, not as yet. Yeah, it's yep. visible. Okay. Yeah, visible now. Yes. Okay. Thank you so much. Um, okay. So uh, I'll be speaking about China in the Rajapaksha 2.0, the uh, Gotabe Rajapaksa's uh, regime. Um, and how ports and geopolitical challenges uh, have shaped uh, Sri Lanka and Sri Lankan foreign policy and uh, some of the challenges that the, the island nation face. So um, my recent uh, books, uh, The Conundrum of an Island, um, basically 
uh, discuss about the geopolitical challenges that the, the Sri Lanka face uh, during the time of uh, President Sirisena's uh, regime, starting from 2015 um, uh, to the Easter Sunday bombing. Uh, so the period was really important. Uh, what you see is uh, uh, recalibration of its uh, Sri, Islands, uh, Sri Lanka's foreign policy. Um, and uh, some of the uh, uh, challenges that uh, that particular regime uh, faced. Uh, the Sri Lanka at crossroads basically is a deep dive to Mahinda Rajapaksa's uh, 1.0, 2005-15 uh, era. So I think both books are now available um, um, in India and and around the world. So um, so uh, I will speak of I'll compare uh, the two Rajapaksas, uh, which is the Mahinda Rajapaksas um, uh, era from 2005-15, uh, and also Gotabe Rajapaksas foreign policy. Uh, what are the challenges that they they're facing, and uh, what sort of uh, difference in their uh, policies uh, do they have? Uh, China and Sri Lanka, um, as Dr. Gupta clearly mentioned about the infrastructure diplomacy that's been carried out, especially in the maritime domain, uh, will be discussed. And the geopolitical and the security challenges. Uh, what is the conundrum uh, that the island nation is facing? Um, the the instability uh, that the most of the leaders from Sirisen and Mahinda Rajapaksa that's uh, you know that's that's coming into the island needs to be understood. Um, so if you look at the the President Mahinda Rajapaksa, uh, which is from uh, two thousand five to fifteen, the one point zero um, era. Uh, his vision uh, was clearly articulated uh, from, it's called Mahinda Chintanaya, uh, where uh, he came out um, clearly about the nation's foreign policy. His stand was non-aligned. Um, and based on the non-aligned principles that he, he would uh, steer the foreign policy, uh, both the regimes, actually Mahinda Rajapaksa as well as Gotabe Rajapaksa, starts with a, a kind of a chaos, uh, which is uh, Mahinda Rajap uh, President Mahinda Rajapaksa from a tsunami, Asian tsunami, where he was, uh, you know, he faced quite well uh, and worked with many uh, donors, multilateral uh, partners. Um, Gotabe Rajapaksa begins with a pandemic, so um, you see. Um, multiple uh, economic challenges uh, coming in, uh, loss of human lives, um, and, um, you know, uh, steering the uh, foreign policy. Um, during the, uh, if you look at the both regimes, um, Mahinda Rajapaksas as well as Gotabi Rajapaksas, uh, I mean, highlights, uh, brings out uh, an ultra-nationalist political posture that they follow. Uh, one uh, the, the the same the political posture was used by Mahinda Rajapaksa to defeat the LTT, and right now what you see is the present president is using the same ultra nationalist posture uh, for economic development and uh, to you know come out of the uh, the pandemic. Um, so you see that um, heavy uh, weaponization of uh, basically. The, the the regime's uh, decisions um, on um, say be it the devolution of power, uh, be it the human rights concern, uh, a quick weaponization is done uh, to uh, cater to the voter base, the ultra nationalist, uh, you know, Sinhalese Buddhist position. Um, now, if if you are not, uh, there's a sentiment that. Um, it's been both the regimes have it that if you're not with us, uh, you know, you're against the nation, that sort of a, uh, a notion is built. Um, and um, which is, which I mean, you see in both uh, the leaders. Gotabe uh, is more with China than his brother, I would say, uh, when, you, when you look at the last two years of his, uh, of the regime. Uh, clearly, uh, starting from the last August, which is um, August, 2020, uh, you see a dramatic shift uh, uh, coming in from the regime, uh, especially with the pandemic and the vaccine diplomacy uh, that's been carried out in the island. 
even right now. The, um, so the China in economic dimension uh, is, is very much present. Uh, but there is a dimension which is not not so much uh, visible, which is the political dimension. Uh, I'm talking about the political parties such as the uh, Rajapaksa's political party, the SLPP, and the Chinese Communist Party. Uh, so they were actually uh, given direct statements, the comments on the centenary. But before that, there were multiple workshops. Uh, it's involved at the think tank level where uh, uh, Gotabe Rajapaksa's endorsed, I would say, uh, uh, think tank, the Pathfinder, and the CRF, uh, China uh, Reform uh, Foundation, has signed MOUs. So you see a much more um, a, a closer relationship than Mahinda Rajapaksa at a, at a level of political level. And the, uh, the development of a, a model um, uh, basically accepting uh, the development uh, model of the CCP, uh, the Chinese Communist Party, uh, basically uh, to the rural areas. And this was clearly mentioned by Gotabe Rajapaksha during the telephonic conversation with President Xi, saying that he would accept the uh, Chinese economic or the development model. The Rajapaksha foreign policy is uh, clearly... Um, non-aligned. I mean, uh, they, uh, if we look at Gotabe Rajapaksa, he mentioned non-aligned also, but then he he uh, clearly mentions about a balanced uh, foreign policy, uh, more towards an, uh, expressing himself as an equidistant uh, foreign policy uh, with a neutral posture. Uh, now, all, all of these terms uh, does not mean the same, so as you know, but they use it in a political um, arena. Um, um, basically interchanging it, thinking that it's it's the same notion, but it then in a neutral posture. But when it comes to um, uh, basically the non-aligned status, uh, as the um, the High Commissioner, in the Pakistani High Commissioner clearly said that, you know, uh, when it comes to uh, actual reality, um, the right uh, do not uh, uh, practice a balance or a neutral uh, uh, a foreign policy, and they are far from it. Uh, rhetorically accepting a balance uh, policy while practicing a China bandwagoning a foreign policy from last August is clearly visible. I have written about it at um, many um, of my articles, um, some of them published at ORF. Uh, Sri Lankan Prime Minister uh, Mahindra Rajapaksa's 1.0 explained that we um, basically uh, do not um, wish to get entangled in big power struggles. Now, both uh, both of the Rajapaksas have clearly mentioned this. Um, but um, you see uh, the China tilted policy, which is practiced uh, in, in the Rajapaksa 1.0 as well as the 2.0, it raised a question among the big powers. Uh, the loss of sovereignty, um, national security concerns, the internal political interference, the human rights issue, media freedom, the trust deficit um, is due to this duality uh, while promising a neutral posture, but then you bandwagon with China is clearly visible. What you see are some of the ingredients in the Rajapaksa 2.0, which is good up as a regime, is a much heavier ultra-nationalist political mandate uh, than the Mahinda Rajapaksas. Uh, a heavy uh, family, uh, I would say, and more nepotism as well as political clientelism, uh, with extending to eight family members, um, uh, basically serving as ministers. Um, it's more of, I would say, when you when you look at it um, from a political science dimension, uh, making it the largest political ministerial dynasty in the world, um, as well as the heavy militarization uh, which is going on, and uh, it's um, it's been, I mean, much of the civil society has been, uh, they have expressed the displeasure. Uh, especially from the recent education bill, uh, which they are trying to present on, um, you know, military getting involved in education. So the securitization and the surveillance uh, state is, is a concern with 28 military appointments to senior positions, uh, which has been highlighted by the UNHRC and various others. So 
you see, uh, uh, the thing is the 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 I would say the majoritarian, uh, the ultra nationalist, uh, um, who who sort of um, voted the government uh, to power uh, has. Uh, uh, ha I mean, it does not have much uh, co concern about this militarization. Um, so you see a new model emerging. Uh, I would compare it. I mean, my recent study um, looking at Myanmar or Pakistan, but it's a new model. But could would I mean it is accepted by the majority in um, the polity. Uh, the China in uh, the regime uh, is more visible and open in its approach with aggressive wolf warrior style. The human rights concern um, is a serious issue. The PTA, the Prevention of Ter Terrorism Act, where you can um, you can arrest people without a warrant, it's being carried out. Um, media freedom um, is a serious concern. So the Chinese support, um, I will come to that, uh, how China supports in these areas. The, um, <clears throat> and the rule of law, uh, which was uh, is, is a concern with the um, you know the recent release of uh, uh, um, of somebody uh, of a convict uh, who's been uh, and a presidential pardon was given uh, to a member of parliament. Uh, so you see um, uh, serious concerns in these areas. Um, so the democratic space uh, has shrunk uh, significantly than the Mahinda Rajapaksa's uh, time, uh, especially, um, I mean, the recent, um, what, what, what's going on uh, in the, the uh, for example, the, um, the abduction as well as the release uh, of uh, civil society activists, the, uh, the journalists uh, are being called. Um, um, so you, you have uh, a more sort of a direct approach um, coming in than the Mahindra Rajapaksa's era. So the gov basically the NGOs are really concerned um, by government regulations and sort of monitoring uh, the activity. Um, so civil administration is challenged by uh, some of the mil mil militarization or the military, military appointments. Um, I, I have done a, a study on this um, with about, um, I mean, 70 interviews carried out. So they are concerned of the appointments. Um, and uh, so when you look at the, uh, that's the democracy space, but when you move, look into the foreign policy, um, um, I mean, clearly the, it started um, with the appointment of um, the foreign secretary, uh, Admiral Kolambage, the former uh, Navy commander, uh, he clearly mentions that uh, you know we will we will follow um, uh, uh, basically a foreign policy, the India first uh, foreign policy, and he clearly uh, states that it means that Sri Lanka will not do any anything harmful to Indian uh, strategic or security interests. Now this was soon after his appointment. He he mentions this, uh, and what you see is. Um, now, now this this was last August, but you see in this all, I mean, 2021 August, uh, the the foreign secretary himself uh, speaks about even the genocide uh, in Xinjiang, defending genocide in China. Now, this is something that uh, very unusual, which uh, a foreign secretary of Sri Lanka has never done uh, in the, in the past. So that shows clearly. Um, the amount of um, China or, uh, or the China tilt in the Sri Lankan foreign policy uh, to go to an extent to defend uh, Chinese human rights concern in uh, Xinjiang as well as other, uh, um, other places. So uh, the recent visit of um, the Chinese Minister of Defense clearly uh, expressed uh, you know, his uh, support saying that the Chinese side appreciate what Sri Lanka's position is and uh, on China and uh, on China's Taiwan, Hong Kong and administrative regions of uh, Xinjiang. And, and uh, you know, in return, that would support Sri Lanka's human rights concerns, reconciliation. So you see uh, 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 a dimension coming in on the human rights uh, a security given to the Rajapaksas on the human rights, which is a which is a huge, uh, uh, I would say, a victory for the Rajapaksas. 
um, in the human rights arena. Uh, the multiple visits, um, starting from Yang Jeki, um, the senior minister of defense, uh, Wang Yi. Uh, so you see um, uh, multiple visits, uh, multiple uh, statements given that uh, that Sri Lanka should uh, not be with uh, certain major countries, uh, uh, basically who are trying to uh, create a click uh, referent to the Quad, um, as well as um, you know seeking regional hegemony, sometimes indirectly uh, referencing to India. It's been very aggressive in its approach, very very direct. I mean, if you follow the Chinese embassies. Uh, Twitter handle, um, which is uh, clearly, um, I mean, it has been discussed at many forums right now. So you would see that uh, a more wolf warrior type um, approach, uh, open, direct approach. And even in going into um, levels that of, uh, I would say, researchers or scholars, um, even the last article uh, which I published, uh, the, the Chinese embassy, uh, send a Twitter uh, message saying that at least get the mess uh, the the picture right. Um, so you wouldn't see that sort of um, uh, approach uh, during the past. So you see a dramatic shift in uh, Chinese um, uh, basically involvement in uh, Sri Lanka's uh, um, foreign uh, foreign policy. So the infrastructure, uh, the layer, which is the much stronger layer. Uh, is the infrastructure as a as a maritime nation an island nation Sri Lanka's geostrategic position is really important. So you see that Hambantota was taken for 99 years, um, uh, you know, debt equity swap taken in. Uh, then you have the the recent port city acquisition, the fastest acquisition ever done in the Sri Lankan. I would say the history is this the, this scale this magnitude done in 30 days. Um, there is a question that how do you manage to do such a acquisition uh, in 30 days? Um, I mean, it, it, it is still a question even to me uh, with the, you know, government bureaucratic red tape, as well as the political, you know, uh, dimensions when you look at it. Um, but China managed to get it done in 30 days. While uh, projecting uh, India's uh, East Container Terminal uh, by by the entire port uh, was uh, basically um, the trade unions uh, had a protest, uh, but but the entire port did not have a, a protest when um, Hambantota was leased out uh, to the Chinese. But this happened when the East Container Terminal tripartite agreement. Uh, I mean, there is no acquisition at all. Uh, was uh, seen as a national security threat. So the amplification was done by certain government proxies uh, they used uh, basically saying that this is a serious national security threat uh, not directly by the government uh, but by the proxies they use the proxies and they uh, when they get their job done you know they just uh, let them go so this is how it operates even the MCC a 480 million grant uh, was seen in the same way saying that they're building a corridor from from Colombo to Trincomalee, and seeing that as a serious national security threat, there was a commission which was appointed uh, by the president to see if there is a national security threat or is there a concern. So the commission report came out saying there is a national security threat, and it's completely false, I would say. Um, but it 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 actually caters the majoritarian voter base. Um, if you look at the Sri Lankan, uh, what's what's happening uh, in Sri Lanka is they're missing the strategic depth uh, of what's going on. I mean, when, when you when you lease out, uh, you know, heart of the city, port city, uh, you need to sort of compare with the other uh, uh, basically special economic zones. Uh, I mean, this is the map of Djibouti, what you have. have, have the special economic zone at the corner here, uh, the right, uh, and then then you have the uh, the military base uh, closer. So, I mean, soon after special economic zone, a few months after that, the Chinese came up with the the proposal to have uh, uh, the military base in Djibouti, their first uh, outpost in the Indian Ocean. Uh, I mean, you, some scholars uh, have said that you know Djibouti is way out. I mean, it's it's a 
it's more of a, a, a cons, uh, I mean, it's you cannot uh, see the comparison, but I, I see a comparison right now because if you look at the touch road uh, economic zone model, which is happening in Djibouti, it's, it's the same thing as the port city. I mean, there is no difference. If you read the Port City Act, they, it's, it's absolutely the same thing. And um, the danger is that China is preparing this special economic zone. Even in Kazakhstan, during my visit to Kazakhstan, I saw the special economic zone that's been built uh, in Kazakhstan. Does, uh, I mean, although it's in Kazakh territory, but it has, uh, China uh, comes into the country. I mean, they do come into the country from, it's a sort of a legal uh, a backdoor which they have to these uh, to these countries and uh, the special economic zone with extra jurisdictional powers uh, would have this um, uh, you know uh, backdoor entry into countries uh, the strategic depth needs to be clearly understood the conundrum of an island is balancing its foreign policy so clearly the it's not balancing its foreign policy right now um, the triple spheres I have, uh, you know, lengthily discuss about this uh, uh, in my book about the Beijing, Delhi, and DC. How uh, a nation like Sri Lanka should be working on a balanced foreign policy. Um, now, uh, Dr. Sriradha Datta, in, in, in her recent article, I mean, she got it right um, clearly, and she understood uh, to take. I mean, she said the relationship to a higher level. It is imperative that Colombo understands and decorative address. India's comprehension about Colombo's lack of adequate sensitivity to India's security interests. Uh, while uh, the foreign secretary speaks about it, uh, the the inception, but then uh, you know you see a significant, and you know, he speaks about Xinjiang. Uh, that shows the clear, uh, you know, the duality. And uh, what Dr. Radha is saying that to bring in the stability, it's really important and uh, of to understand India's security interest. Um, I mean, it's, 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 uh, it's, it's, I mean, even yesterday, I spoke to one of the foreign service officers and it's the first time that Sri Lanka did not have a high commissioner for two years almost. Uh, when the president is appointed, the, one of the first foreign, foreign service appointments is, is a high commissioner to India. But that did not take place uh, up to now. Um, and Austin Fernando, the former uh, High Commissioner, left in January 2020. So there's absence in uh, there. The, the growing trust deficit um, is, is, is very clear um, because of the, uh, you know, the multiple, uh, you know, the, the projects that has been suspended. Uh, for, for example, Japan's LRT, the uh, ra railway, the uh, USMCC. The, uh, the ECT of uh, East Container Terminal of India, while accepting uh, almost all Chinese projects. So you see a significant trust deficit. Um, now, a new roadmap is to be um, basically uh, the new ambassador who's uh, designate, uh, who, I mean, uh, Melinda Moragoda, who's, who is going to go to India. Uh, I hope he will go very soon and who will speak about a new roadmap promising a, a recalibration of foreign policy. So that that is actually not necessary, a uh, new roadmap, a recalibration. If you do it from the inception, if you follow uh, a balanced foreign policy, why would you need to recalibrate? So um, so you, I think the, 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 one of the questions that uh, the, the Sri Lankan public has, as well as many other scholars, why was, the Chinese, the, every government mentions, even Gotabe Rajapaka said that we, I will revisit the Hambantota port, the 99 years, and I will revisit. And he was, uh, I mean, it was quite popular uh, comment that he made during his election, but he never revisited. This is um, the chairman of the uh, port, uh, Dayarat Nayaka, the former chairman. I mean, he just uh, stepped down a few months ago. But he clearly says that there are unclear clauses in the Hambanto report. This is the chairman of the Port Authority who is speaking and uh, a senior military officer and uh, that he needs to revisit. But why is it that uh, none of them could re revisit? They couldn't revisit. This is the Sri Lankan former prime minister. Uh, he mentioned that Sri Lanka backtracks 1.4 billion Chinese port project. Uh, 
although they backtrack uh, 1.4 billion, but they revisit back again, saying that it's one of the best things that Sri Lanka had the investment as well as that. So, um, well, it, it is a serious question um, that that the dragon can never be investigated. Um, what the Chinese fear has to be understood uh, in Sri Lanka as well as in the region is that I see that uh, a triangular uh, power projection surrounding India. So, I mean, we look at CPEC in uh, China, Pakistan, as well as the economic corridor that they're building in one corner of India, the other corner, Bangladesh, India, and my economic corridor. Um, both of these corners have uh, sort of multiple challenges that, I mean, one, one stemming from coming in from Afghanistan right now, the, the troop withdrawal, it has connections. Or, or would it, I mean, coming in from the Myanmar, what's the state of Myanmar right now? Um, I mean, both sides, as well as on the, the bottom, where this is from Sri Lanka, a more semi autocratic models have been built uh, surrounding India. And uh, so this is a serious security threat itself. The new models that and a heavy investment of China in all three corners, um, be it the marine sphere. So if you look at the Colombo uh, or the Hambantota port city or in Guada, and also the Djibouti. So it's it's not much of a, I mean geographically, if you look at it, the, the distance uh, is not so much. The the, the triangular projection uh, of China is very clear and visible. The China is building um, multiple uh, layer, I mean, the levels of entry into the Indian Ocean. Um, the, the, you know, the Kra Canal is one of them, but then you have, uh, they're altering the ge geography, uh, trying to find alternative routes. The, the question here is that what uh, Parag Khanna clearly mentioned, I mean, um, he says that will, how, would the defensive approach uh, become offensive? Um, will it, can, it could uh, quickly become offensive uh, um, because of the China belligerent behavior in the Indian Ocean, if you look at submarines during Mahinda Rajapaksa's 1.0 time, as well as the, the recent, the, the, you know, the, the ship with the nuclear substance that came. And um, we were serious uh, concerns. So you do have... Um, um, you know, a significant maritime challenge. The recent, um, the mini lateral between Maldives, India, and Sri Lanka is a great success. And we need more sort of uh, mini laterals like that in the marine domain and to secure the maritime domain. The debt trap is uh, discussed um, by many scholars. And this is a recent article by Atlantic, which I don't agree. Uh, it was published on the 6th um, by Deborah and Meg. Um, we're clearly mentioning that the, the narrative is wrongfully portrayed, uh, both by Beijing and the developing countries it deals with. The events that led to a Chinese company's uh, acquisition of a majority uh, stake in a Sri Lankan port reveal a great deal about how our world is changing. Uh, now, China, China and other countries are becoming more sophisticated in uh, bargaining with one another and it would be a shame uh, if the u.s fails to uh, learn alongside them now this is what they are uh, they're discussing in their article uh, chinese firms and banks learn that strong men fall and that uh, they'd better have uh, strategies for dealing with political risk uh, they are now developing these strategies getting better at uh, discerning business opportunities and withdrawing uh, where they know they can't win. Uh, still, American leaders and thinkers from both sides uh, of the aisle give speeches about China's modern-day colonialism. So, if you, I mean, the uh, it's it is not a myth. It's a uh, death trap is there. It's clearly visible. Uh, there is a trend that is going on. I mean, in different places, such as in Chatham House, uh, a few of the scholars in there as well are saying that you know it is a myth. Now, I don't agree with them, um, and it is not a myth. Uh, China's involvement in domestic politics need to be calculated. The constitutional coup which happened in Sri Lanka, none of them speak of this uh, constitutional coup, and in and when the Chinese ambassador visits the Rajapaksas. Uh, soon after the coup, 
congratulating him. I'm talking about 2018. Uh, uh, so as well as the political funding uh, that comes into the political parties, uh, the CCP and the, um, the Sri Lanka SLPP of Rajapaksa political parties, the strategies that they have in place, um, and also the strategic depth is missed in this uh, article because when you're looking at the numbers only, uh, you're, you're doing a quantitative analysis saying, look, the Chinese uh, Chinese uh, funding is not so much uh, than the, uh, if you look at this, uh, uh, basically the table, this is the one of the latest table from the central bank. Um, I spoke to a few of the researchers even, it said, look, the numbers, if you look at here, uh, number two, if you go down, these are the countries of bilateral uh, lending. China, as you can see, starting from 59, uh, then moving up to 124 million. So here you see that uh, even Japan, uh, India is much more higher bilaterally, uh, even the uh, commercial loan. So the, the, the quantitative analysis does not capture the strategic depth. Uh, that's what I'm trying to explain. And um, the what's here the, the 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 strategic depth is that the china would use its uh, you know um lending the um multiple loans such as the 1 billion as well 1.5 billion and uh, making dual use of these infrastructures especially the port um and the the militarization would it happen and the um and where it says that there is no sophistication in in bargaining uh, due to possible side i mean i because of the the efficiency how it is being carried out the chinese projects as well as the chinese approvals i don't doubt that there there are significant side payments uh, not limiting to political parties but also to the main actors china has taken away the bargaining power uh, from sri lanka due to its aggressive behavior now the company uh this was clearly mentioned in a uh, new york times article on the company responsible even for building the hambanto report allegedly funded 7.6 million dollars so how could you have a competitive environment uh when this is happening um so china understanding strongman fall i mean you know i'm going back to the article which they learned the high yes that's true and now involved in setting up and supporting a semi-autocratic uh, type regimes in a heavily military just like in sri lanka um so, so what you see is like uh i mean dr ganeshan vignaraja he clearly mentions um, this was in the chatham house article that there is no debt trap where he argues that however the same author he says uh, in a recent article saying that sri lanka is not in a chinese debt trap but could be at a risk in the future if uh, unfettered borrowings and commercial terms were to continue. Um, so my assessment has been that the economic uh, quantitative projections fall short in capturing the strategic depth of these projects. The Chinese projects has a long-term strategic design, which could easily bring the hybrid model, the civil military activity to the country, a security concern for Sri Lanka and to the region. So one cannot dismiss the scenario uh, in a future day that Sri Lankan governments will be told by China. The Chinese priority in the Indian Ocean is to secure its infrastructure and maintain and contribute to maritime security. Now, just like in Djibouti, the Sri Lanka is vulnerable uh, due to its strategic location and economic dependency to China. Um, so some immediate measures, my last slide, um, is to recalibrate the Sri Lankan foreign policy from the China till to a balanced uh, foreign policy. Now, I know that the, um, the foreign secretary also mentioned about a 20 point foreign policy sometime back, but it's not available uh, to the scholarly community as well as uh, to the parliament. So it should be made available and clearly articulated. Uh, this is the foreign policy of Sri Lanka, a balanced foreign policy. Recalibrating is really important right now. Understanding the strategic dimensions of this project, um, not only on the economic terms, but on the long-term security implications is really, really important. Um, 
if the Chinese projects are transformative, uh, a future, uh, for example, a future government can amend certain clauses of the 99 year leases or the port city, it's fine. But none of the, this, this, this was not possible to any of the regimes. Transparency, is, the lack of transparency is a serious concern. Uh, building with standards is really, really important. Uh, B3W, build, build better, um, you know, um, the initiative of the G7, well, well, I would I would comment on that. It's really an important initiative uh, at a time like this. Uh, commitment to a rules-based order in the Indian Ocean, um, like with the other like-minded nations, Sri Lanka was a democ is a democratic, I mean, from the past, uh, practices, democratic elections, democratic values. So it's important that we, with like-minded nations, the, protecting the democratic norms is really important uh, the addressing the concerns of the minority concerns, uh, human rights issues are really important concerns. Uh, not going on, with, you know, uh, on the track of uh, Xinjiang and supporting on the Chinese uh, model. Um, Indo Lanka relations is key, and strengthening relationship with New Delhi, uh, you know, the new roadmap which is coming up, uh, Sri Lanka's commitment to a rules based order, not limiting to rhetoric. And uh, you know, actually uh, doing it is really, really important. The, so the losing the foreign policy balance uh, is the conundrum which I have discussed in my book, and which will invite uh, instability to the country. I thank you. Thank you, Asangaji, for that uh, brilliant uh, uh, presentation and uh, what comes out uh, uh, from your. Uh, uh, talk is that uh, deep unease that you feel about uh, the developments in Sri Lanka and uh, particularly the loss of uh, balance in Sri Lanka's uh, foreign policy. And you have uh, argued uh, quite uh, convincingly that uh, uh, Sri Lanka's foreign policy needs to be recalibrated and uh, there is a strategic uh, angle to uh, China's relationship uh, with Sri Lanka or Sri Lanka's relationship with China, which is often marked by uh, lack of uh, transparency and also China's new approach, uh, yes. that is the wolf warrior diplomacy, and uh, they're becoming uh, uh, quite bold uh, in terms of their uh, uh, interactions with the political parties, with individual leaders, and so on. And uh, you mentioned how in 30 days the uh, entire project was uh, cleared and uh, which is really uh, say something about uh, China's uh, method of uh, working in Sri Lanka. Uh, I would even uh, generalize it to say that uh, China is following similar policies in uh, the other countries uh, as well. And uh, I think India needs to understand uh, this uh, better. Uh, but uh, what India can do, I think we'll discuss this, I'm sure, in the Q&A, and maybe you could also give us some uh, uh, insights. You are talking about some roadmap on uh, uh, India-Sri Lanka relations, but which is uh, not yet uh, uh, known. Uh, yes, uh, I think uh, uh, India and Sri Lanka are uh, uh, geographically very close and we have a long history of uh, interactions uh, and uh, there have been ups and downs in our uh, relationship and uh, as you said that uh, the the foreign policy uh, the the current leaders are articulating the foreign policy uh, and uh, talking about neutrality but it's a question of uh, whether they follow it uh, in uh, practice or not uh, India has this neighborhood uh, uh, first policy, uh, which I think uh, uh, needs to also be, uh, you know, given a fresh look and uh, should take uh, uh, on account some of these uh, factors uh, that you have uh, mentioned, because maritime space is uh, very important. It's not just bilateral, but uh, what happens uh, to India-Sri Lanka relations will also have a major impact on in our uh, uh, neighborhood. So thank you very much for uh, uh, underlining uh, those points, and I'm sure there would be some